Howdy Leadership Scholars, welcome back. We are still on forming. I promise we're almost done. But as we talked about before, this is such an integral step to team success that we really need to hit this a little bit longer than maybe some of our other sections will be. So we talked about identifying this idea of group member roles. There are several different models you can choose from. You know, we talked about possibly using Myers-Briggs. We talked about using strengths-based leadership and strengths, um, the strength survey, if that's something your team has already done. I have had former students utilize either True Colors, which we have a free version of, or there's actually a couple of other different color uh, associations, and they're really expensive, but they're very cool. Um, I know Shell Corporation has one, and it's almost like an Enneagram. So you've got a color and then a subcolor, so like an Enneagram number and a wing. You could use Enneagrams. You can use anything that you want to do in order to just talk about what do we bring to the table that's different. That's what group members, group member roles are. But the, the one I want to present to you today, and the one that has the most scholarly research behind it for teams specifically, actually comes from, look at this guy, and he's so cute. Okay, this is Kenneth Benet, and he's from Boston University. And his partner, Paul Sheets, was actually from the University of California. And they met at a management conference, and they started talking about some of the, I would say, holes in the leadership literature Holes in the fact of what they've seen in the world of, the, of business and how it could be done differently and what we're missing when it comes to leadership research. And that meeting actually led to their model of group member roles. So again, back in 1948, y'all, this is tried and true, tested, been around. So what they kind of found is that in leadership research, and y'all, we still have this problem to this day, there is too much attention paid to the leader. That we only focus, it's still very leader-centric. We don't talk enough about followership. Don't even get me started on that. It's one of my favorite things to talk about. Um, it's not the F word of leadership. We don't talk enough about interaction. We don't talk enough about culture. We are still too focused and myopic in, in this day and time and definitely in the 40s on the leader. So you have to actually look at what's going on with the leader. What are the relationships among and between the leader and the followers and the followers and the followers? So a lot of their work is where our leadership theories of LMX and our leadership theories of, um, oh, phooey, I just had a brain fart. Well, like situational leadership, um, talking about the impact uh, on an organization that a transformational leader comes from. So a lot of those theories that kind of gained popular um, association and research in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and, and now with values-based leadership and, and followership, um, they were saying this back in the 40s. Like, we need to actually pay attention to this. And once we have a team together, once we have our core organization, we need to train the members to recognize group member roles. And if you've done a lot of work with personality typologies and how to utilize that going through, and again, I use True Colors a lot with small groups um, because it, it tends to be easy. For the one I have, there's only four colors. It's gold, green, blue, and orange. And you can remember that, right? You can remember four things. Goodness knows with Myers-Briggs there's so many different combinations. You can't keep any of them straight, right? Um, unless it's your own, you know, combination. Then you know all the characteristics of that. So colors to me is a good thing. And that's when they talked about this group member roles. And you'll see in a second they actually break theirs into three larger typologies and then some subcategories within that. But it's easier to work with someone once you figure out who they are. Are they a, one certain color and you're a different color? Well, what could that mean? How could that be beneficial to the team? How could it cause potential conflict? Um, so it's really just know thyself and then being able to recognize other people's characteristics. And if there are any group member roles that are missing within the team, well, you can train yourself to be that group member role, or you can find a new teammate that that's their natural role. 
And so it really helps you create this holistic team, right? Something that is representative of all the skills, knowledge, and abilities that you need. So lots of benefits. You get increased involvement, and I'm going to say also buy-in when your natural roles are used. So not to skip ahead, but basically it's task, relationship, and individual. I know personally, relationship is usually where I hang out when it comes to group member roles. I'm actually more worried about the process than the product. And in some ways, that's super beneficial for the team. Um, but in other ways, like if a certain task has to be done and I don't know how to do the task, let's say it has to do with lots of numbers and there's lots of details. Both of those things I'm really bad at. Well, ethically or not, I'm more likely to either cut corners and get it done quicker, or it's going to take me so long because I'm not good at doing those things. And so I just check out. So when we think about this, I think you probably can identify with some of that. If we are asked to do something that we're really bad at or we're not naturally good at, it is disheartening. So group member roles say, all right, if you're using your natural group member role in this team, you're going to have increased involvement from everyone. And there is that relationship back to personality. There's that rela the relationship back to leader typology as well. So if you think about task and relationship orientation or all the different behavioral leadership theories uh, like Blake and Mouton and University of Michigan and Ohio State and all those guys, um, then that is definitely a, a kind of tie back to how could that work? And then also, who do you want to be led by? Who do you want to work with? right? And how does your personality impact those things? It's a really great tool to be proactive in identifying where conflict may occur. So to go back to that kind of task and relationship orientation, if you have someone that always thinks with their heart and you have someone who always thinks with their head or their five senses, they're going to see the world very differently, right? And usually the one with the heart says, oh, well, I just see the world differently. And that's okay. Many times the one who thinks with their head using the five senses is like, no, I'm right, you're wrong. Yeah, that could be some conflict, right? Um, and so there's a lot of things that you can be proactive um, before you get to the storming stage where you know storming may occur just because the group member roles that they naturally fulfill are just so different. And it's a really cool way to use non-hurtful labels um, when you're discussing the group process. So what do I mean by that? Um, when you're talking about forming, when you're talking, when you're in the middle of storming, think about it. When you're in a fight and you start saying, you know, you're dumb, or maybe you think it and it comes out, or you start saying, I can't believe you do this. Well, you know, people can take that personal and people can make that pretty personal, right? And so using these kind of frames allows you to engage in those crucial conversations in conflict without making it personal. So you may, you may say, oh man, you're really task oriented right now and I understand that, but we've got to talk about the process at this point, not the product. So can we, you switch for me for a second? Right, that's better than saying, hey, you're a jerk and all you think about is yourself. <laughs> right, that's not nice. Um, so it's a great way to use those words in the process of team development. And it helps you gain insight into group issues. It could also help you gain sight into, insight back into those norms and culture. So if you take a look at your group member roles, you're still trying to establish those norms, right? You're still trying to establish the culture. And if the majority of your team has more boxes clicked in the relationship orientation, well, you know you're going to have a great time as a team, but you may not get much done. So in, in order to kind of think through that, then you have to think, all right, as a norm, we're going to have to be super purposeful with our meeting time so that we don't spend more than, like I talked about earlier, five or 10 minutes um, listening it, to people talking um, about nothing. You know, we got to get on task. So when you diagnose group member roles, here are three ones, group task roles, 
where the person is focused on facilitating and coordinating the group effort working towards the product, right? What do we need to be, what do we need to do in order to be effective? And that is very much a, like I said, task-driven, product-driven role. The group building and maintenance roles, um, this is looking at how do we make our team better? How do we make sure everyone is heard? How do we perpetuate um, group interaction? How do we make sure we're staying on Tuckman? Things like that. So what I've uploaded for you there in the module is an actual B'nai and Sheets group member roles survey. You can take, you can give to your team, you can give to your significant other, you can give it to whoever you want to. Um, and it will show you which big category you're in. A lot of people, when they take this for the first time, they score pretty evenly between group and, and building and maintenance roles. So again, sorry, task and maintenance roles. That is because we have had to socialize ourselves into doing all the things. Um, a lot of that is because, and think about it, if you're in grad school, you're probably more type A than not. A lot of us that are type A, we've had to take up the slack. We've had to learn to do the task, or we've had to say, all right, I can't do this alone. I have to work with people, so I have to empathize, right? And so because of that, our natural roles have kind of gotten muddled. So that's something to think about. The last one is individual roles. Now with this one, um, these are things that could detract from the team. This could be that it's they're all about what's in it for me. We'll get into what the, the specifics of this might look like, um, but this is just kind of the derailing, right? And when you answer the, the, the questionnaire, you may be like, no, that's not me. Um, but we all have those days, y'all. We all have those days where we are stuck in that individual role, like too wrapped up in our own drama. So just to clarify, um, you're probably going to have more than one specific group member role. So again, we're talking about big characteristics right now or big categories. These three things are broken down into smaller typologies. And so you may see yourself in lots of that, or your team may ask you to say, hey, I know you're usually this group member role, but we need you to be this for this specific project. So let's get into these. What do they look like? The first one on task roles is the initiator contributor. So this is the person who has new ideas, innovative ideas, isn't afraid to share those kind of crazy off wall idea, uh, off the wall ideas. So they're really great at brainstorming, at spitballing, at say just throwing something out there to see if it sticks to the wall. That's the initiator. So they're willing to accept that risk that we talked about in the former lecture. They're risk takers. Um, they just want to improve the task. The information seeker, they ask a lot of questions and they don't want your opinion, they want facts, right? So don't give me a diatribe about, you know, your thoughts and feelings. Tell me what has been your experience with this. Um, these uh, are really great researchers as well. If you find yourself in this category as a group member, um, there is a vague idea of what needs to happen. And so this person will jump down that rabbit hole and, and find 40 different citations that say, this is what we need to actually do. They seek that information. Then you've got the opinion seeker. So this person still task oriented, they want to know people's opinion as well as just the information. So in your opinion, do you think that will work? right? They're also really good, the opinion seekers, at sussing out people's motivations. So what's behind that opinion? Has your experience led you to that because you are, let's say, because you're a ginger? You've got red hair. You've had this experience in life. So you're motivated because of this, that you can't go out in the sun very often. So that makes your opinion maybe a little bit different than somebody else's, but they're really good at processing. <laughs> this person, I think we all know this person. I call this my Aunt Rhonda, the opinion giver, because Lord knows my Aunt Rhonda gives her opinion very freely. Um, it's that idea that they are not afraid to say, that's stupid, or that's awesome, 
So it can be both ways, um, but they want to make sure that their voice is heard when it comes to this decision. The elaborator. So for this one, I think this is really interesting. It can go both ways. It could be someone who finds examples of maybe the initiator's idea or asks for specific examples from other people, digs deep into what is the meaning of that? What is the meaning behind that? What is the catalyst for that? And then looking at the rationale. So it's really interesting because it's almost like a combination of the information seeker and the opinion seeker. They're, it's a really neat combination of those two roles, if that makes sense. The coordinator, oh, I love these people. They're good at details, right? And because they're really good at details, they can see the connections between ideas. You know, a really good coordinator, I think, kind of sees in 3D. Um, I sucked at trig <laughs> because I'm really bad at that, at modeling, uh, things like that. But some people are really good at saying, all right, this leads to this, which leads to this, which leads to this, and this is how it's all connected. And they can coordinate that. And the reason why details are important, and if you're thinking about like coordinating seven people's schedules, trying to find a meeting time, that coordinator can see that visually and pull that together really easily. The orienter, I tease my husband all the time because he tells me as I'm telling stories, Jennifer, land your plane. Um, I don't take it personal because I know he's an orienter. He wants to bring it back to what is the heart of what's going on. So these orienters don't like their time wasted. They want to be very productive and efficient. Not, I mean, effective, yes, but efficiency is probably more important than effectiveness because we know that sometimes it's more effective just to talk it out. Um, but it's more efficient just to get back to what we need to do. So the orienter does that. You know, in the middle of the chaos, I always think about the people. Um, if you're familiar with parliamentary procedure, if there's a lot of discussion on a motion, someone can stand up and move previous question. And if they do that, that means discussion stops if it passes. Discussion stops and we have to vote. Those are our orienters. The evaluator critic this is a person who is going to ask a lot of questions. And at first, it's not a big deal. But sometimes when the critic comes out, they could be a little snarky type questions, right? You can get a little snarky. Um, but the evaluator is not afraid to ask why. You know, they are engaged in critical thinking. They follow the queen model of critical thinking. They question, they understand, they, they explore. They want to make sure that everything make sense. And so the best way to do that is to ask questions. The energizer is the one that says, all right, let's do it, right? We've got to have somebody on your team that says enough just talking around the, the campfire. Let's make this happen. Or we've tried this four different times in four different ways. Pick a way and let's do it. Let's all get around this one idea and let's go forward together. I love this uh, procedural technician. These are our hard workers, right? These are the people that are willing to get the work done. They're not afraid of grunt work. They're not afraid to um, to put in the, the manual labor and the heavy lifting and the long hours, whatever it takes to get it done. And if you don't have any procedural technicians, again, if you have too many admirals and not enough sailors, your boat's going to sink. So you need these procedural technicians to get the work done. And the last one, and I think this one is one of the easiest ones to identify, is a recorder. This person is the person that keeps records. Some people are really good at that. We have an administrative assistant in our department that, oh man, she's so good at minutes. Um, I don't know how she does it because not only is she keeping minutes, but she's engaged in the conversation and she does it all at the same time. I think my ADD is too bad. I think I would be super bad at that. Um, but there are people that are awesome at that. And if that's your natural group member role, then roll with it. Nah, get it? All right. Now, group building and maintenance roles. So again, these are the more relationship and process oriented roles. 
So you've got the encourager. Um, this person is going to say, that's a great idea, right? I agree with your assessment on that. Um, how can we make this better? Sorry, I'm going to turn off my email so we don't get any more dinging. Um, making sure that people contribute equally, right? They encourage those that may be a little bit more quiet to engage. The harmonizer, um, making sure the cruise director, maybe is another way to put it, um, making sure that people's conflict doesn't either get out of hand or um, mess everything up. So it's they're gonna say, they're not afraid, a good harmonizer is not afraid to pull two people aside and say, hey, I think there's some tension going on. What's truly happening? Or go to each one separately and say, hey, are you having a problem with Jill? It seems a little tense. What can I do to help? And they're not there to get their nose in everyone's business and they're not going to do it publicly. Um, but they're just going to make sure that the conflict doesn't escalate to where it's detrimental. Now, the compromiser, and when we get to conflict, we're going to talk a lot about how this person isn't necessarily the best thing for a team. They will compromise just so conflict doesn't happen. And the reason why that's not a good thing is that actually leads in the norming phase to no one wanting to engage in conflict because they're scared of it or they just want to, don't want to deal with it. And if everybody's compromising, then something is going to happen that's probably not so good, right? Um, we're not having those free flowing ideas or someone doesn't feel like they are um, safe enough to say, hey, I, I don't don't think we should do this. Um, and we'll talk a lot about that with groupthink as well. Um, but this one, this person can easily become a doormat. Um, and so you have to be, if this is what you usually do, you may be like, yep, that's me. Um, you know that that is getting run over by those that maybe have a little bit more force behind them is something that happens with a compromiser. It's pretty detrimental. The gatekeeper, they work along with the encourager to make sure that everyone participates. So it's not just, um, just encouraging them to participate. They will actually take that step to make sure everyone has a job. Everyone um, feels comfortable. Everyone um, is part of the process. And so going back to that that poker chip uh, thing, you know, it, I bet that teacher was a gatekeeper, right? Making sure that everyone had the chance to contribute. A standard setter when it comes to building and maintenance roles is a is a person who has those lofty ideals. They understand the goal, but they also have, they, they keep everybody in check because they have, I guess it's really the Pygmalion effect, right? They have this, um, this feeling that we can be greater than what we think we are. We can do this in a more cost prohibitive way. We can do this um, working together in a different way. And so they set those high standards knowing that the rest of the team will work hard to get there. The commentator keeps records of all group process. So it's a little different than the recorder. Um, when the recorder is, you know, taking minutes and looking at details and spreadsheets and things like that, the commentator is going to be looking at the process. So are we in, what stage are we in, right? What stage is coming up? What should we be thinking about if we're in the forming stage? We know that the next thing that comes up is going to be some growing pains, which means storming. So how are we going to deal with that, right? So they're almost one step ahead of the process, getting the team prepared to do it. And then sometimes you have some passive followers. They go along to get along. They're still productive. They're just really passive about it. Um, they're not going to be out there encouraging. They're not going to be those contrib or the initiators from the task. They're going to do the work, but they're you, you may have to prod them just a little bit. Um, they're not the social loafers. We'll get to those guys in a second. Um, so they're there. They do their job. They just eh. they're just whelmed. You know, not overwhelming, not underwhelming. They're just whelming. Yeah, makes sense. So let's talk about these individual roles. Um, super fun to talk about. Terrible to have on a team. So you can have an aggressor. <laughs> this is someone who's just a jerk. You know these people. They're around. Um, 
you don't know why they have a burr underneath their saddle, but boy, they have something up their crawl. And it doesn't matter what the topic is. It doesn't matter what's going on. They're going to have something to say and be mean about it. Um, maybe it's mean to other team members. Maybe it's mean about other people in the organization. Maybe a different team that they've been on. They're just, again, they're just jerks. A blocker. The blocker is someone who is constantly negative. So this is going to be like a negative Nelly or a Debbie Downer um, and resistant to everything. No idea is good unless it's their idea. Again, you know these people, right? You're like, oh, just because it's your, it's not your idea doesn't mean it's not good. I cannot tell you how many times I've heard that in team meetings. All right, the recognition seeker. Um, it's all about me. Uh, this could be, as we looked at that meme earlier, the person that scoots in at the end and is super charismatic and gives the presentation and takes all the credit. Um, it could be that when maybe a, a senior vice president or, or something in your organization comes to hear about what's going on, even with the process of the team, they're going to be the spokesperson and they're going to make it all about them. I had a teammate once, no lie. I've told this story in several classes because it's just so funny and it's true. He spoke about himself in the third person. And we had a new teammate come into our team and he was talking about how, you know, let's call him Nathaniel. Nathaniel says this and Nathaniel understands this and Nathaniel thinks that this needs to happen. And so this new teammate leaned over to me and he goes, who's Nathaniel? And I'm like, that jackass, right? Okay, so he was a recognition seeker. The self-confessor. So this type of individual role uses the team as their personal counselors. And you may think, oh, that doesn't happen in the business world. Oh, oh, it does. Um, I had a, well, I was actually in graduate school. It was a, it was a team, uh, team in graduate school. And one of our teammates was going through, well, he was in a terrible relationship. I mean, just awful. They were toxic. And every day he would come into these meetings and be like, oh, this is what Sarah did today. What should I do? And we're all like, break up with her is what we should do. Can we please get back on task? And so, but he just kind of turned that into, um, hey, you know, help me, right? This is what I think. This is what I need. They did end up breaking up, which it was a good thing. They're both now happily married and both have children. Okay, the playboy or playgirl or play them, whatever we're talking about now. It, uh, they make a display of the lack of involvement, right? So it's fun to be the one who doesn't care. So they're cutting jokes, they're on their phone, they're flipping through TikTok, they're looking at Instagram, whatever it may be, they are not engaged, but they are also bringing other people with them. Uh, I think about, you know, colleagues that sit in faculty meetings, which are the bane of the world, trust me. Um, but, you know, they're clicking on their computer, you know, they're not paying attention. Honestly, one of them, I swear, is on text ags the whole time. Um, and then he'll find something funny and he'll laugh and he'll like nudge the person next to him and point to his computer. And so he's completely a playboy. Um, sometimes, and I've seen this too, playboy can move into actually like hitting on um, another teammate. Like they're there just to scam off of some some unsuspecting person. And it's not just men. I've been in teams where women have done this as well. Um, and you know they're only there because they're hoping to hook up with a teammate. It's crazy, y'all. The dominator. Um, this is the person that is going to be the loudest. Again, the reason why we had to have the poker chips in that class. Um, they could assort, assert authority or superiority um, skirts the line of being an aggressor. You can be a dominator without being a jerk. Um, you just you just get tired of them, right? Because you're just always, always talking. Okay, the help seeker goes along with that self-confessor sometimes, um, but the help seeker, there's always drama, real or perceived. And so this person within a team could be like, oh, I don't know, you know, 
Donna looked funny at um, at Sam while ago. I think there's something there. So they become that human spoon, right? Just to stir things up so then they can go in and save the day. Then the special interest pleader. So this one, that and we all have personal agendas. Like I, I don't want to say that we don't. But they go in and sneakily work for their own personal agenda. Um, so they're working for the greater good, but they're trying to get their dig in there. And I say that we, there's sometimes that we do this, not really thinking how detrimental it may be in the long run. I've done this when we've had, um, oh, sorry, there's the dogs again. They're making their appearance. Um, we've had like an open position for our department and I want a leadership person, right? I think it needs to be a leadership person because our classes are big and we teach a lot and, and we need some help. And so, you know, I will be that special interest pleader and say, hey, if we look at our, our student numbers, um, where do you think our greatest need is, right? Without saying, hey, leadership always obviously has the biggest need because we have like twice as many students as the other majors. So let's make this work, right? That, if you do it that way, you become the dominator or the aggressor. Um, but that special interest pleader is trying to get your way without uh, kind of doing it smarmy, not gonna lie. That's kind of a little smarmy, um, but just on the sly. But people know, hey, you're actually working for your, for your own agenda. So while we have our natural fit into these bigger categories, but specifically these smaller roles. You, know, you may say, oh, yep, I recognize myself as this, this, and this. Um, it's important that we have flexibility, but it's important that we also know where our natural tendencies lie, right? That's really important. So as you go through and you are developing, again, that, that final project, Think about how do you want to use group member roles? Um, how can you make this work? I know it, when my undergrad class, when we would actually get them into teams and, and they would do a team project and the team project lasted the whole semester. It was very cool. Um, we would do some role play. And, the, you know, people are like, ugh, role play. But they ended up loving it because they could role play these different roles and what it might look like in a team. And it just helps people, to, you know, to learn them and internalize them but you know it may be hey let's give everybody the survey and see which big category they they fall into and then let's have a discussion about these smaller roles and and what you see because you may have somebody that says man i'm great at minutes or somebody else that says i'm really good at looking at details well if you have that then where do they fit and then what are you missing in order to have now you don't want a whole lot of individual uh, group member roles, right? Let's take a step back and really think it's more of the the task and the maintenance roles that we want to have represented. So if you skew too far one way and not the other, it can become problematic. So think through that. How can you utilize this going forward? Catch you on the flippity flip.